So one day, many years ago, a boy was walking down the beach one day when he spotted a woman sitting under a beach umbrella. So he came up to the woman and he asked her, are you a Christian? And the woman said, yes. So then he asked her another question. Do, do you read your Bible every day? And the woman nodded her head, yes. So he asked her another question. And, and do you pray regularly? And the woman said, yes. So then he was ready to ask his final question. So, will you hold on to my quarter while I go swimming? <laughs> I like that. He, he had determined that if she's a Christian, if she reads her Bible every day, if she prays regularly, then she can be trusted with this quarter. And I think he's right. Disciples of Jesus who are committed to prayer and Scripture should be trustworthy, right? It should be good. So today as we continue our series on discipleship, I want us to continue to explore some of the essentials for disciples. So far, we've looked at a couple of them in the last couple of sermons. One of those essentials was that, that we're characterized by love. Disciples of Jesus are to be characterized by love. The other essential we've covered so far is that disciples of Jesus are devoted to Jesus. And you can see why those two things are so important, right? Loving God and loving others, the most important commands of Scripture. And Jesus is our everything, like we looked at last week, right? He is God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. He is our Savior and our Lord. And His gospel is what saves us. The good news that we're saved by grace through faith. Today I want us to focus on why the Bible is essential for disciples of Jesus. So over the years, you know, I've heard people say that, that the Bible is... God's love letter to people. And I like that, right? I like to think of, of the Word of God as God's love letter to us. You know, all of us love to get personal mail, don't we? Of course, because of technology and changes like that, we, we don't get as much uh, of the old handwritten letters and cards anymore. Things are more uh, sent out uh, through technology these days, but... There was a day when people would write lots of letters, right? And, and there was a day when some romances, some courtship even, took place completely through the snail mail. Imagine that, right? And so through the Bible, God's love letter to us, we come to know God and we develop a relationship with God. So the practice of studying and reading, meditating on God's Word, these are fundamentals to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. A disciple will not know who God is or what God wants without knowing God's Word. So, so God created His Word. He, he inspired it. It is His authorized Word, and, and knowing and trusting in and obeying God's Word is the primary means by which we develop and maintain this relationship that we have with God. So last week, we focused on the importance of Jesus, and uh, there's no one more important to us than Jesus, right? So, so the Bible clearly unveils the identity of Jesus, and the greatness of Jesus. Every book of the Bible really points to Jesus, the, the grand story of God's redemption through Christ. And that's why the Bible is a key source for making and maturing disciples of Jesus. So in discipleship, we commit ourselves to learning to live as Jesus would want us to live. To live like Him, like He was in our place. You remember the, the, the WWJD craze, right? What would Jesus do? Great question. Something we disciples need to always be asking. But a common mistake is to think that discipleship is just mastering the content of the Bible. To just have the knowledge of the Bible. Which equates discipleship with just education. 
Now, learning facts and content is important, and, and of course it's helpful to us, but it's not the goal. The goal of discipleship is to know Jesus and to follow him, to put into practice the teachings of Jesus and the will of Jesus. Now, some people mistakenly think that the Bible is kind of this optional thing for Christians. You can take it or you can leave it, right? Uh, they might be intimidated by the idea of reading the Bible or studying the Bible or memorizing Scripture. So they try to distance themselves from these spiritual disciplines. But it's not possible for us to be faithful disciples without the Bible playing the proper role in our lives. Discipleship requires a commitment to learning about Jesus, His ways and His teachings. And the Lordship of Jesus is exercised by carefully following the teachings of Jesus and the rest of the Bible, which we can't do if we don't know it, right? How can you obey the Bible if you don't know the Bible? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 5, the Apostle Paul described a key aspect of discipleship when he wrote about taking our thoughts captive to obedience to Christ. Think about that. This is one of the, one of the practices of discipleship, is, is, is taking our thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul said it this way, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So Paul says our transformation is grounded in the renewing of our minds. And that renewing of our minds comes as we allow God's Word to shape our thinking. So while knowledge is not the end goal of discipleship, it's vitally important because how we think will determine how we live. And I appreciated Alan's uh, thoughts there in the call to worship, which melds so good in what we're talking about today. What we think determines how we live. And therefore, as a disciple, what we think needs to be what God thinks. So we will live the way God wants us to live. So discipleship requires a manual. And the manual for learning to be a follower of Jesus is the Bible. So let's look at that uh, scripture reading that we had today, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here Paul describes the role that scripture should play in the life of a disciple. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable or useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, Paul declares all Scripture comes from God. It's inspired by God. Literally, God breathes it into existence. He inspires it and breathes it into those human authors who spoke it and who wrote it down for our use. Paul specifies how the Word of God is useful or profitable. And he describes them as teaching and rebuking and correcting and training. And you can see how the Word of God can accomplish those kinds of things. And as disciples, we must allow the Word to do that in our lives. To teach us, and to rebuke us and correct us, and to train us for, for our life in Christ. And as disciples, we must allow those who are leading us, those who are mentoring us, right, those in authority over us, to use the Scriptures to do those things for our well-being to teach and rebuke and correct and train us so we can grow up in our walk with Christ. In the verses that follow the ones we just looked at here in 2 Timothy 3, Paul goes into, into 2 Timothy 4, goes on to warn us about the importance of knowing and adhering 
to the word of God. He says, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearance in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. But listen, for a time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. So Paul said a time was coming when this was going to take place. You think the time has arrived? Oh yeah, I think the time's been here for quite a while, right? But from those verses we see how important it is for disciples to stick with the truth, with God's Word, and to be sure we're teaching those that we're mentoring to follow the Bible. The Word of God is our ultimate and final authority. And this is true when we feel like it, and when we don't feel like it, right? And it's true when the Bible suits us, and when it doesn't. In season and out of season, right? In popularity and when it's unpopular. In a recent discipleship.org forum, Francis Chan, who I know some of you uh, enjoy his writings, he gave these powerful insights. Discipleship in this day is a lot of people getting together, sharing their feelings and thoughts. That's not necessarily negative, but he goes on to say, so, so as leaders, we have to teach people to be able to teach others that your thoughts don't really matter that much. And you can't believe everything you think and feel. That's such an important lesson. Just because you think it and feel it doesn't mean it's right. He goes on to say, and we come under the authority of Scripture, and we have to be honest and say, look, there's things in this book that I don't agree with, I don't think, I don't feel, but I surrender to it. And when I disagree with this book, I assume that God is right and I am wrong. We have to teach them that and show them that. And the greatest thing that any of the guys who discipled me taught me was how to read this book for myself, unquote. So teaching God's word requires great patience, careful instruction. And we have to start with the understanding that God and his word are always right. Right? God and his word are always right. And we must understand there's going to be this ongoing human tendency to want the Bible to say and mean what I want it to say and mean, which might be what it says and means, but on the other hand, it might not be what it says and means, right? So some of the best safeguards against mishandling or misinterpreting the Bible are these. One, when you study the Bible, let the Bible interpret itself, right? Let the Bible interpret itself. Number two... Study the Bible with other honest, sincere believers. Don't just depend upon you and yourself and your own insights. But number three, depend on the Holy Spirit to guide and to interpret the Bible for us. That's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit, right? So on a practical level, how do disciples allow the Bible to play the essential role that it needs to play, how do we instill the same in those we're trying to disciple or mentor? Let me just give you two things quickly. First, I want to encourage us to make a commitment to study the Bible with other disciples in Bible classes or in small groups. And so, you know, here at Wetzel Road, we, we try to offer lots of different 
experiences for Bible study. And, and I know right now, during the pandemic, this has become a little more difficult. And, and, and even so, we still are offering virtual Bible studies. And hopefully sometime very soon, we can get back to more of an in-person Bible study opportunity. But let me ask you, have you in the past regularly been a part of our Bible studies that we offer? And right now, are you presently participating in the virtual Bible studies that we offer? If the answer is yes, great, keep it up. If the answer is no, why not? Why would any disciple not take advantage of opportunities to study with brothers and sisters in Christ? Secondly, I want to encourage us to make a commitment to spend some time in the Word of God daily or on a regular basis. The Bible supplies the nourishment for our souls, right? It is our spiritual food. Francis Cosgrove wrote, Our spiritual growth is directly dependent on our consistent intake of the Word of God as our spiritual food. Where do we get that idea? We get it from the Bible. Peter, when he wrote his first letter, he said, Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Other verses talk about the meat of the word of God. So regularly we get this idea that the Bible is our spiritual food. But it isn't just new Christians who need the word Spurgeon. The great preacher said, nobody ever outgrows Scripture. He said, um, the book widens and deepens with our years, and it does indeed. George Mueller said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in the exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and in our thoughts. So Francis Cosgrove, in his book on the essentials for discipleship, uh, gives these five ways. He says there are five ways to get into the Scriptures so that the Scriptures can get into you. I like that. Five ways to get into the Scriptures so the Scripture can get into you. And the first way is hearing the Bible. So faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And most of you know that the websites that you can go to that have Bible on it, or the apps on your phone that have the Bible on it, you can choose to have it read to you. So you can hear the Word. We used to have to have it on cassette tape or, or CD, right, to be able to hear the Word. And maybe you have those and can use those. But, but hearing the Word is a little different experience, isn't it? Have you ever been listening to the Word and say, I'd never heard that before? How did I miss that in all my reading, right? Right? I'm an auditory learner, and so it's very helpful for me to hear because I learn a lot better that way. So number one way for the Bible to get into you is to hear the Word. The second way is to read the Bible. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near Revelation 1 and verse 3. When Paul wrote to Timothy, his son in the faith, he said to him, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Every year I encourage the congregation to have a regular reading program, right? How many of you have a regular reading plan? How many? Okay, excellent. Doesn't have to be the plan that I propose. You can find your own plan. There's lots of them out there. But having a reading plan gives you some structure and direction. You know where you're going. This, this flip open the Bible and let it flop wherever it may is not a good reading plan, really, right? We want to hear the whole Bible over the course of time. So sometimes the reading plan I suggest is the whole Bible in a year, which is quite a, an undertaking, isn't it? Other times it's just the New Testament with the Psalms and Proverbs or something like that. But regular reading is so important. So we can hear the Word to get it into us. We can read the Word to get it into us. And then number three, we can study the Bible. And you know the Bereans were held up as such a good example 
Because they studied the Word, right? There in Acts 17, the people here in Berea were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica since they received the Word with eagerness and examined the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And Paul charged Timothy with the words, be diligent to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, who correctly, correctly teaching the word of truth. Some translations say, study to show yourself approved. And, and so the, the study of the Bible helps us to correctly handle it. So study is different from just hearing and reading because in study, we try to dissect and investigate to understand the word better. And as we study, we might ask ourselves simple questions like, is there an example for me to follow in this thing that I'm, that I'm reading and studying? Is there a command for me to obey? Is there an error for me to avoid? Is there a sin for me to renounce? Is there a promise for me to claim? Is there something this text teaches me about God that I need to understand? Of course, the most important question of any Bible study is, what does God want me to do with it? How do I put it into practice? How do I obey it? Because as James reminds us, it's not just hearing the word that matters, it's doing it, right? Doing the word of God, uh, James 1.22. So we can hear it, we can read it, we can study it. Number four, we can memorize the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The ESV says stored. And uh, the C CSB says treasured. I have stored your word in my heart. I have treasured your word in my heart. I have hidden it there that I might not sin against you. And so we store it there through memorization. You know, the more Scripture we have fixed in our mind, the more tools available to the Holy Spirit, right? In order to help us in those moments of temptation or to help us in those ministry moments where we need a word from God to guide us or to teach someone else. You remember how Jesus quoted Scripture when He was there with Satan? He didn't, he didn't pull out His Bible and say, uh, let me turn over to... It was up here. It was in here, right? And it worked. He won the battle. And the final way, so hear the Word, read the Word, study the Word, memorize the Word. Number five, meditate on the Bible. Meditation is simply reflecting on what you have in your mind. It's, it's taking that scripture and trying to think through it over and over and try to figure it out and just meditate on it. Think about it. And my favorite verse on the power of meditating is Psalm 1. And you probably like this one as well. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. And he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. How's that for an amazing and wonderful promise? The person who takes God's word in, meditates on it, is guided by it, has all the nourishment, strength, and health that we need for our spirit. So in summary... A disciple of Jesus is someone who takes in the Word of God on a regular basis, right? Reading, hearing, studying, memorizing, meditating on. And one of the things we always should remember is anytime we open this book, we're on holy ground. This is the Word of God. This is God's Love letter to us. And that's holy. A man named uh, J. Wilbur Chapman offered this simple plan to follow when handling God's Word. These four simple things. Number one, study it through. 
Investigate some of God's word every day. Number two, pray it in. Ask God to help you understand it and apply it. Number three, write it down. When you learn something, jot it in the, in the margin of your Bible or, or put it uh, in your notebook if you have a, a notebook journal type thing for your study, right? Write it down and work it out. Put it into practice. Four simple steps. Study it through, pray it in, write it down, work it out. It's impossible to overemphasize the importance of the Bible in the life of every disciple for our own personal growth as a disciple and for our ability to train, uh, to, to train others uh, in, in, in a disciple-making way. So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. One, Psalm 119, 105. So let me ask you, how are you doing as a disciple with regard to handling the word of God? How are you doing? Are you giving enough time and effort to read it, study it, and obey it, share it with others? I hope so. If not, repent, right? And begin to do what God wants you to do. But if you aren't yet a believer in Jesus, if you, if you aren't yet a disciple of Jesus, one of the best places to start is with the Word of God. Start reading it. And go to one of the Gospels. Maybe start with Mark or John and, and read. I guarantee you, if you read the Word of God, it will lead you to faith and faith in Jesus and a desire to become one of his followers.